Good evening, everyone. I'm Claire O'Dowd. I'm research curator at the Henry Moore Institute and a very warm welcome to tonight's discussion event, which is on fabrication and accessibility. Uh, to give you a bit of background, this event has arisen from a series of research events that we did a few months ago on the subject of sculpture and fabrication, which we ran in partnership with our brilliant colleagues at Pangea Sculptors Centre. So over the course of several months, we spoke to artists and educators and fabricators about their work in an effort to discover more about how sculpture is made and by whom. And if you missed any of those events, you can catch up with them through our website and our YouTube channel, which I am contractually obliged to encourage everyone to subscribe to. Um, we had some fantastic and very open and honest discussions about all aspects of making sculpture. And one subject that came up peripherally in the discussions and in several comments from our audience was accessibility. This is all very well, people said, but how do I as a neurodivergent artist or how do I as an artist with a physical disability get to do this kind of thing? Where do I start? How do I get funding or support? What are the things that need to be considered if I'm going to be in that kind of environment? Um, and there are lots of barriers uh, for artists, some of which we discussed through those uh, fabrication season events, but it seemed like these are questions that needed to be explored further, hence tonight's discussion. So we're largely going to be focusing on practical aspects of working with fabricators for artists with different kinds of disabilities. Um, before I introduce our speakers for tonight, um, I need to go through the usual Zoom housekeeping rules. So this event is being recorded. It will be available on the Henry Moore Institute YouTube channel, as well as on the Henry Moore Institute website. Uh, if you need subtitles or you have them and you don't want them, the subtitles can be turned on or off by clicking the closed caption button on the bottom toolbar. That's the one with the CC symbol on it. If at any point your video freezes or you're having connection issues, we recommend restarting Zoom and you can rejoin using the same link and we'll let you back into the webinar. As always, we would love to hear your thoughts and questions throughout tonight's event. So please do join in and ask your questions as we go along uh, and we'll feed these into the discussion as we go. You can submit questions and comments using the chat function, which is found along the bottom toolbar. If you want us to mention your name, please include it in your message, otherwise we will keep you anonymous. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our three speakers for this evening. Our first guest is Anna Berry. Anna is a self-taught artist who works mostly in non-gallery environments. Anna doesn't work with a single set of processes nor a single set of ideas, which she says makes her a very ineffective art brand. Accessibility is an important subject for Anna because she has both physical and cognitive disabilities. And she worked with fabricators for the first time on her touring piece, Breathing Room, which is an immersive kinetic light installation that changes the viewer's experience of space and sometimes even consciousness. And you can see Breathing Room later this month at Wordfest in Wakefield. And we're gonna hear more about the project and about her experiences of making it from Anna shortly. Welcome also to Tony Heaton. Tony Hi. is a practicing sculptor. He is chair of Shape Arts and is a consultant and advisor to many major cultural organizations, including the British Council, Tate, and the Research Center for Museums and Galleries. And he is the initiator of the National Disability Arts Collection and Archive. Tony's sculpture Gold Lame recently occupied the Liverpool Plinth and is currently installed at the Riverside Museum, Glasgow. His monument to the unintended performer was installed at the entrance to the Channel 4 TV Centre in celebration of the 2012 Paralympics. Tony was awarded an OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2013 for services to the arts and the disability arts movement. And he's been awarded honorary doctorates from both the University of Leicester and the University of Buckinghamshire. Tony is a wheelchair user and has worked with fabricators on multiple projects. And lastly, I'm delighted to welcome back Nigel Schofield. We met Nigel previously during our discussion event on careers in fabrication. Uh, Nigel is the director of the fabrication studio MDM Props. 
He holds a BA in 3D design, as well as further qualifications specialising in wood, metal and plastics. He began his career as an artist and model maker working in theatre, film, TV and the art world and later joined MDM, who celebrated their 25th anniversary in 2019. MDM's client list includes Damien Hurst, Tracy Emin, Yinka Shonabara, Anish Kapoor, Yoyo Kasama, Marina Abramovich and Anthony Gormley, as well as the British Museum and the National Gallery. One thing that we established last time we talked with Nigel is that although his client list might seem intimidating, Nigel is definitely not. And uh. MDM work with artists at all stages of their careers and provide advice and support to artists at all levels. So thank you very much all of you for joining us tonight. Um, to begin with, um, I'm going to ask our three speakers to give us an introduction to their work and to tell us more about what they do. Uh, and we are going to kick off in alphabetical order again with Anna Berry. So Anna, if you could share your screen and tell us more about your work and about your experiences of making Breathing Room. Great, we can do this. Screen share. Uh, Right, do you see a slide? We do, oh, excellent, lovely. You know, if I knew this is going on YouTube, I still would have worn like makeup or something. Oh, well. <laughs> um, hi everybody, my name is Anna Berry and the lovely Henry Muir peeps have asked me to, to talk to you a little bit today about my experiences fabricating my piece breathing room. Um, so I'll spend about five minutes telling you a bit about how my practice developed and then five minutes telling you about the fabrication of that, that piece. and. Hope there's something vaguely interesting for somebody out there. Um, so uh, a bit about my practice, I don't have an art degree, um, so I was really just kind of making my own pieces and putting them in public spaces as interventions and that kind of thing. Um, so here's some street interventions and, uh, oh hang on, let me close the caption a bit, there we go. Uh, oh, Milton Keynes. Um, so I put a lot of work in underpasses in Milton Keynes because a lot of my work's about Milton Keynes as a place and planning and utopianism and all those kinds of ideas. Um, and as things kind of gradually grew, um, occasionally I've managed to pick up a little bit of funding, usually from disability arts and the odd residency. Um, so this, for example, was part of a set of pieces I did on a residency in America. This one is Iceland with a horsey. Um, this one is Cambridge. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into any detail about these pieces because there isn't there isn't time. But do feel free to like contact me if there's anything you want to know more about. Um, as you can see, I work a lot with paper and non-archival materials, and I was making increasingly big projects um, with kind of long, repetitive, upfront makes and very short-lived outcomes, um, which were then recorded. And this was a piece in Iceland where I was trying to place paper boats in an ice cave and my fingers were like too frozen to lift the boats and the wind kept blowing them and my camera battery was freezing and you know I'd have to try and keep it in my armpit and so it, it really was a kind of absurd exercise in futility and I kind of realized at that point that it, it wasn't straightforward installation I was doing my practice was kind of occupying a bit of a hinterland between performative making installation and, and recording. Um, this was a performance installation in the US called Dirty Money using poison ivy and dollar bills. And I did have to actually wear a hazmat suit to do that one. Um, so, and in between uh, doing odd things like that, I was still basically doing completely unfunded work um, that was just made by me with a bit of help from my pals and stuff. Um, I was mostly on benefits because I'm disabled and my work's very kind of vocational, I suppose. Um, so I'm not really someone who's known in the art world at all, um, and I don't seem to get shown in sort of galleries or be on the radar of curators and such. Um, so this piece was really kind of the apotheosis of all of that. It was a, a 14 by 10 meter pop up installation, which took months and months and months to make. And then a couple of days with a lot of friends helping to install. And it lasted for like two hours. Um, and there's a long explanation to this piece. And again, I'm, I'm happy to sort of link you to it afterwards but very briefly people kind of weaved their way through this sacred forest of plastic to touch the saint's relic of this much loved oak in Milton Keynes that had been destroyed. So we had a sort of two hour pop-up event with musicians and poets and about 300 people um, on a rainy Tuesday in June a few years ago. Nobody from the art world of course but <laughs> 
Um, so I did get my, my first tiny bit of Arts Council funding for this piece, which was in a library, um, and it's a big kinetic piece, and it, again, there's a lot of explanation to it, but it's a sort of metaphor for the permission giving give, that we give to advertising to kind of colonise our subconscious and our kind of role in the greater machine of consumer capitalism. And I should have attached a video because it's a, it's a kinetic piece and you sort of wind a crank and they all kind of move around you like planets. Um, it's called the constantly moving happiness machine if you want to read about it. Um, this is one of the only pieces I've ever had in a gallery and that's because it was for MK Calling um, and that's where they sort of let in local artists in Milton Keynes so it kind of doesn't count. <laughs> but it's a kinetic piece using a compressor process that I've been working on. Um, no, this is a video, so I'll show you the movement. So, yeah, they kind of puff up and then gradually go down. I call them my puffer fish. Um, so I'm sort of hoping at some point to get some proper funding to work with an engineer to produce like a big outdoor version of that in my dreams. Um, so uh, that's kind of a bit about my... My practice generally. Um, this is the first iteration of, of Breathing Room. Um, so in amongst all of all of the stuff I'm telling you about, um, seven years ago I did an installation as part of MK Fringe in an empty shop unit and it was a kinetic piece and, and quite sort of political and it was all made of donated paper. This is sort of quick video of the sort of movement that it had. Are the videos coming across okay? Are they working? Yeah okay good. Perfect. So it kind of booms and breathes in the night. Lovely. Uh, okay. Um, so at this point, I was kind of flirting with fabrication for the first time in that I'd ordered lots of, of one meter squared wood frames um, from a local reclaimed timber place because I figured I was buying the timber from them anyway and I'd save myself the hassle of spending ages making squares. Um, so I invited also lots of engineers around to my house for tea and cake and to discuss how best to get it moving and in the end you know me and a bunch of mates went to a breaker's yard and we clambered all up towers of cars because they don't give you any ladders uh, with socket sets and extracted loads of windscreen wiper motors. So I think the first one we had about 16 windscreen wiper motors. Um, and it, it was quite a huge problem. Actually, it was all too fast. So we put it, we put them all through a thing called a pulse width modulator that um, essentially allows you to turn down the voltage. And although it's digital, it sort of makes it feel like analog because you're turning a dial to make something slower. So it wasn't the hyperventilating room kind of thing. Um, and the engineer I was working with in the end was my friend Clive and we kind of worked together ever since. Um, the structure of it was these wooden squares and I used rubble netting, which is kind of slightly flexible anyway. And that was suspended inside the squares with elastic so that it was very movable in and out. And the cones, which were paper at that point were, were literally just kind of stapled on to the rubble netting. Um, and then uh, I had a script and I'm totally deviating from it because I'm getting all like, excited explaining all the process and stuff. Um, but I mean, basically we had a pair of garden canes literally just attached to either side of the, the windscreen wiper motor. And so you had a kind of reciprocating lever thing where one bit goes in and the next square pulls out back and forth. And, um, and that's actually still the essence of the mechanism we use now. And it's all, you know, a bit more pimped up now, but it's the same, same thing. A uh, few less cable ties. Actually, that's a lie. It's still full of cable ties. Um, so I was lucky enough to get an R&D grant from Unlimited to develop it. And as we developed it, we changed direction much more to focus on the kind of sensory experiential element of the piece. Um, so we've developed it for outdoors and we've made it modular. So this R&D is one module, which is one kind of right angle corner. Um, and, and the sort of big version would mean you could have different configurations of different modules for different kind of site footprints. Um, so this interim version allowed us to work out the outer armature, which goes up first um, in the form of sort of archways that, that support everything. And then the precise geometry of the inner frames, which are obviously all metal now at this point and replace the wooden ones. My rubble netting is now vertical strips of carbon rod onto which my cones, which are now Tyvek, are threaded. 
Um, and in this version, there's only one motor per module and then one really large axle with kind of gear ratios and stuff, but still essentially just paired levers like the, the first version. So now we get to, I don't want to say the final version because I really hope we can still go further with it, but the current version, um, so I take the plunge and apply to Unlimited for a full making grant, and that was really high risk for me as essentially an unemployed person, because it meant that if I didn't get it, I couldn't retrospectively pay my producer for the work that I'd, I'd needed in the application, and I would have had to have like got on the credit card and just cried kind of thing. But luckily we did get it, and we were able to build four of the modules from the previous version. Um, so when it's all laid out in, in a snake, a curly snake formation, and um, it's about 16 metres long and the, the whole thing, you know, moves. Um, my friend Clive still worked on the mechanism, which is now, I don't know if you can sort of see from this picture, but it's high up at the top now, so no little fingers can get caught in bike chains or anything. A um, few extra finesses, some fuses, flanges, washers, that kind of thing. Um, but this time we had the metalwork fabricated. So they were able to make the archways actually curved, which we hadn't been able to do. Um, and they basically made jigs you know, for lots of repeating pieces. Um, and, and that made sense really because it meant it wasn't me spending four months welding squares basically. Um, and in this version, the cones were not rolled by me for the first time ever. We were actually able to offer it out as piecework um, through COVID. So we had our little cone elves um, rolling away on kitchen tables throughout the pandemic. And, and that's quite interesting, actually, because we, we've got about sort of 30, 35,000 cones. And if we'd had like maybe 100,000, then it might have made sense to try and get them manufactured. But with, with things like setting up factories for single runs and stuff the numbers didn't make sense so it really was about finding people and getting people to work for us and it was local people so it was it was nice um so anyway it went from being just just um me and then me and Clive and and now it's like this whole massive team of people like a producer and a production manager and fabricators and, and techs and the whole kit and caboodle really um so I'll sort of try and show you the, the movement. It's actually really unsuccessful usually to try and do that by a video because it's a really subtle movement and it needs to be immersive. So there's a sort of differential between what's happening in your periphery and what's happening in your central vision because when you're immersed in it, it's, it's happening all around you. So it's kind of really unique and, and primal kind of sensory experience that you can't really, can't really replicate. But I'll kind of show you a little bit what it looks like. So it has like quite a sort of eerie pirate ship kind of noise to it. And every so often there'll be a sort of mini bang where the, the tension goes from being tense on the top of the chain to tense on the bottom of the chain and things like that. Um, um, so, that, I mean, the whole experience essentially consists of this brightly lit um, kind of skeletal armature on the outside. And it's a big, it's 50% of the experience to see that very visually as you approach it. Um, and you see this kind of quite tortuous mechanism. And then that really contrasts with the inside, which kind of bathes you in this luminous light and moves very, very organically. And then that gives you a kind of really weird sense of the uncanny, basically having just seen the very mechanistic outside. Um, so yeah, it can feel quite quite profound. I've had a few people cry and things like that in it, just, just sort of feeling weirdly sort of moved. Um, so that's it really. Um, yeah, that's that's it. Thank you for listening to me waffle on. Thank you, Anna. That was brilliant. Really looking forward to seeing that when it comes to Wakefield. Okay. Um, Tony, can we hear about your work, please? Yes, and I've even remembered to unmute myself, Claire, which is kind of a minor <laughs> miracle for me and technology. But yeah, thank thanks for inviting me. Great to hear what Anna had to say there. 
I, I'm, I just do a little bit of background about my work and um, and show some slides as well. And um, the the um, I think firstly, I just wanted to say that I've been disabled for very many years and I went to both art college and then on to university as a disabled person. And in my interactions with other humans, I'm almost always reminded that I'm perceived as a disabled person, as a wheelchair user. And this is sort of manifest in their actions towards me and their interaction with me. And of course, much of my work as a sculptor explores this kind of personal analysis of these sort of everyday interactions, really. And sometimes for me, the art making process becomes something of a sort of self psychoanalysis. And I was struck by a comment um, by the artist Gil Baslitz, and he said, um, you cannot escape your history and the trauma of your experience. What are the echoes that follow you? And I, and I thought that was a really, um, I don't know, it just, uh, the observation really resonated with me within a disability perspective. Of course, I think Baslitz was talking about it from a historical, from a German historical point of reference but it but i just think uh, you can apply that to you to that statement to your own life and your own experience and um another comment when i was at university was by one of my tutors who was quite influential um a couple hatton and we were doing work it was a sort of environmental art was at the forefront and we were working on morecambe bay and around the same time that andy goldsworthy was working on, uh, on Morecambe Bay in Lancashire. And he's, I walked with um, crutches and my feet stick out a lot. Uh, um, I don't walk very much now, but um, he said, I always know where you are Heaton, because I can see the marks that you leave in the sand with your crutches and your footprints. I don't know where everybody else is or who they are, but I always know where you, you know, sat behind a rock having a crafty cigarette and, um, and he said, I think that's really interesting and you should explore it in your work. And, and, and basically I did. And it kind of became early disability arts really, though I didn't know at the time that there was such a genre as disability arts. And uh, it was a while before I actually knew such a thing existed. And then, uh, it, and it didn't really in a way, but, um, but we know the genre exists now. I mean, we've got 30 years of, history behind it and as a school crowd, I've always been working collaboratively with other people and I when people ask me about it I always say well it's a little bit like an architect um, architects have visions draw plans they know what they want to build but then they have to involve others technicians people with specialist knowledge quantity surveyors fabricators builders and I, and I think a sculptor does exactly the same thing. So I'm going to just look at some of my work to sort of example this. I think I'm looking at three or four pieces. And the piece on the screen at the moment is actually a computer-aided design. It's a render. It doesn't exist in the real world. And um, I, it, it, the piece is called Monument to the Unintended Performer. And it was um, a commission by Competitive Tender by Channel 4 TV. Um, I... I, I applied for it, I tendered drawings, I tendered this CAD render and a maquette and a written sort of exposition about what, what I was going to do to try and resolve this idea. And I went through a number of interview processes and uh, I was selected and I was offered to work with Adam Scott at Free State Limited. And Adam's a brilliant guy, he's very experienced, creative, and he was essentially the producer on the project. Um, we also brought in uh, um, a company of designers called Millimeter, and they worked on the recent Cara Walker piece at Tate Modern, which many people will probably have seen. Uh, Atelier One were the structural engineers, and they worked with people like Gormley and Mark Quinn and Anish Kapoor. Um, they, they were really oh, enlightened uh, architectural lighting and Surat Neon. And, and if we just show the next couple of slides, please. Um, this is the piece in construction so it's outside channel 4 tv it's i think everybody knows what the big four looks like it's that big four structure which you can kind of see in that that first image and, and basically what i was doing there is cladding that image with objects to to create this piece 
And uh, yeah, and, and you kind of see the scale of that when you see the people from Millimeter. Can we just pop back a quick slide? You can sort of see the guy in the cherry picker at the top and this big head coming in to sort of knock him down sort of thing. So it's, I think it's about 50 foot. Um, can we have the next one, Adam? Please, thank you. And that's the finished, sorry, that's the finished piece that was outside uh, the channel, the Channel 4 building for the 2012. Uh, um, this next piece is called Square in the Circle and it's at Portsmouth University. And again, this was another competitive commission with a producer called Zoe Partington. And it's five large pieces of Portland stone and it's arranged to create a, a circle which surrounds a square and it just plays around with that idea of alchemy and the squaring of the circle. The image you just saw was the finished piece looking down on it um, from, a, from a tower block building nearby and this is me looking a bit daft in a, a hard hat with, um, with one of the pieces that I've been working on. Um, don't get any idea that I made all these five pieces because there's a team of um, brilliant stone carvers at Albion Quarry down in Portland. And I should say that uh, I started this piece with a maquette, which I did make out of Portland stone, much smaller maquette. And I do all my Portland stone work down at Portland Quarry um, with Paul and Hannah at the Portland Quarry Sculpture Trust, who were brilliant makers. And uh, Albion Stone Quarry is right next door where this piece was created. And they do lots of architectural stone work. They do pieces to renovate St. Paul's Cathedral. But what I'll talk about while, um, while the images come back on is that um, to make the five pieces, I designed the, um, I des designed the square that the, the, the sculpture was going to sit in. So um, in the flags on the floor of the quad, there's a square which is in black granite slides and there's um, a white circle of white, uh, white stone. So the square and the circle are already imposed on the floor. And then the five pieces were brought from Portland Quarry to, um, oh yeah, we're back. Yeah, if we can just pop back a few when you get, when you get a minute, yep. If we go to the next one, and then the, so you can see the square and the circle on the floor, I hope there. And then if we go to the next slide, these are the five pieces that are starting to appear. Uh, they've just been driven from Portland in Dorset to um, to, to the uh, to, to the um, Portsmouth University there at Lion Gate Square. So we unload it. We can go to the next slide, please. And it suddenly dawned on me when they started dragging these these five pieces that I designed actually in situ together. And I so suddenly had this cold shiver of, you know, will these things line up with the, with the floor? Um, so it was really nerve wracking whilst we put this in, but if we show the next slide, you can, underneath you can see the drawing and then we're just lining up some bits of stone, which, which we're putting the big pieces on. And they, the, the, those pieces stay underneath like that, but the orange, trace gets taken away. Okay, we can see the next slide. So this weighs about 15 tons in total, and it's about 25 feet in circumference. And really making it all line up was, a, was an absolute uh, nightmare for me. But we got there in the end, and uh, if we go to the next slide, please. You can sort of see, see it taking shape here in the next slide which again is the finished piece, which you can see looking down on. And part of the rationale behind the work is that it becomes inaccessible to a wheelchair user like myself. So to actually enjoy the, the incising of this each piece, it is kind of, um, it's pulling together the circle and the square, which is which sort of etched within, the, uh, within the, the Portland stone. Okay, next one, please. This next piece is called Gold Lame, and uh, it's a sculpture that I made for Dardar Fest, and it hung in the Blue Coat Gallery, and then it occupied the Liverpool Plinth um, before, well, actually after Dardar Fest, it went to America, uh, to a couple of galleries there. But this, again, is a, a, a CAD design. It's a um, computer-edited design. Uh, this is actually an image of the Vide in the Blue Coat Gallery, 
and we just imagined what a gold invalid carriage would look like hanging down there. So this was part of selling the idea for the work. So if we go to the next slide, this is what the reality looked like. I bought an invalid carriage, which they stopped making in 1986 off the internet. You can buy anything off the internet. And uh, it was, it was surrounded by about 10 foot of weeds and grass in some guy's garden who collects all kinds of wacky cars. Okay, next slide, please, Adam. And that, there's a picture of me uh, proving that I was actually did some work on this. Well, I just, um, you can use fabricators or you can just use the guy that fixes your car down the garage. So this is my local garage guy. And I approached him and said, have you ever heard of invalid carriages? And he said, I made my apprentice working on invalid carriages, which is kind of weird uh, and symbiotic relationship that I never knew anything about that with him. So, so I did quite a lot of work on this. If we look at the next slide, I should say I also used to have one of these when I transitioned from motorcyclist to invalid carriage driver. And, and this is it in paint. Again, it's in the it's in the garage rather than in the fabricator's yard. But um, so I think this is the first paint of uh, the first coat of paint that we put on it. OK, we look at the next couple of slides. And this is it going up into the Vied at the Blue Coat Gallery. You might see the RSJ running across the roof. That didn't exist. The Blue Coat Gallery had to very kindly and helpfully put in an RSJ to take the weight of the vehicle. And uh, they also had to put power up there because the indicators flashed and the lights flashed on and off. You, you do the next slide, please. So we dragged it up and suspended it there. And uh, and the Vied was, the Vied's a beautiful place. It's a sort of three, I think three or four stories. You can just see the the handrails on the side where the lifts, the lifts come out. And a technical team at Bluecoat worked with me on this. And also Chris Butler at Castle Fine Arts Foundry did uh, the logistics for the install on the next couple of slides. Oh yeah, the next one after that. And this is, um, this is going on the Liverpool plinth. It's the first sculpture on the Liverpool plinth. And this is St. Nicholas's Church uh, um, at Chapel Street. And uh, this is, this is Golame being uh, craned onto the plinth. Uh, we can see the next one. So the plinth was made specially by Chris Butler, fabricated it. So it looked like it was sort of plunging to the ground a little bit like it did when it was hanging in the V at Blue Coal. Uh, next one, please. And this is it all wrapped up. So you've got to, do you know what it is yet? And then, because uh, it was like that for about a week before it was officially unveiled. Uh, next slide, please, Adam. Thank you. And that's it when we just finished and they were just hustling down the ladders. They did offer to, to winch me up on that, uh, um, that big crane. I don't know whether they were actually joking or serious, but I did turn down the offer to get that close to it on the grounds that I knew what it looked like. So I was up in the hotel opposite having a, having a glass of brandy while they were doing all that, which I think is the proper place for artists to be while fabricators get about doing what they do best. Okay, next up is, I think, oh yeah, um, this is called Raspberry Ripple. It's um, neon and a projection. And again, I wanted to show you the CAD design for this. So this is the computer aided design of, and we just put it in the VED because we had a photograph of the VED from Gold Lame. So we literally just imposed this on it. And we said, that's what Raspberry Ripple would look like when it was fabricated. So can we go to the next slide, please? And this piece was commissioned by um, Lumiere London, by Helen Marriage, uh, Artichoke, and they worked in uh, um, partnership with the lighting specialists at the South Bank Centre. So this was it for the um, Lumiere Festival two years ago on the South Bank. And it's just above the Nelson Mandela sculpture, if people know what that is. Just let's have a look at the next slide. And this is looking at it from the direction towards the river. So the river's down at the bottom, Nelson Mandela's on the, no, we're looking into, into town from the river. And then you get the reflection in the window opposite. Um, next slide, please. 
and this is Raspberry Ripple as a neon piece that was made by Neon Workshops in Wakefield. And they're, again, great people to work with. Um, and they make all my neon now. And they're always good at giving advice and guidance on what you can and can't do with neon. And I can actually say now with some authority that this piece is, I've had to keep the lid on this for, for a long time, but it, this has been commissioned by Artichoke for the next Lumia Festival, which is in Durham in November. So this is going to be up there as a neon piece. And it's not called Raspberry Ripple, it's called a bigger ripple, but it's going to look pretty much the same, but it's going to be a little bit bigger. Um, okay, uh, I've got some slides that I want to show you later, but for now, I just wanted to say that I work in bronze, fiberglass, jesmonite, and I've always worked with technicians, and I've always found them incredibly creative and helpful, and really good problem solvers. And one of the first pieces I ever made in public realm was in Manchester, and it was called Grey Mares, and um, the I made some stainless steel gallopers that were like a Fogger ground ride. And they were cut at the Barrow shipyards where they made nuclear submarines. And they were cut out of water lasers, which about 30 years ago was new technology. But um, it's amazing what you can get done and where you can get it done. So um, you always be surprised out there really. But I, I would say, uh, you know, a shout out for guys who mend cars or spray cars or weld water tanks or, you know, fabricate things, you know, if you've got somebody, if you want some welding done and there's somebody down the road making gates, you know, if you take a good idea and they know what you want, that they, they, um, they can be really helpful. And uh, I think sort of finally, I just wanted to say, um, I don't think there's, a, you know, the so-called able-bodied myth, which is, you know, can disabled people make sculpture? And I just always remind people that, even Henry Moore had assistance, you know, Barbara Hepworth had assistance, Michelangelo, you know, the Renaissance, Gormley Quinn, Damien Hurst, they all had assistance working for them. So, you know, the able-bodied bit, don't get, don't get put off by that. I think, you know, disabled artists can do anything that non-disabled artists can do. It's just about knowledge, resources, and of course it's about power and rank, you know, and it is impossible to make work in the public realm without working with other people, without working with curators and fabricators. And uh, that's the easy bit. The hard, the hard bit is winning the winning the, the commissions in the first place. And uh, I know, because I lose loads of commissions. <laughs> and on that sorry end, as the violins kick in, I'll, uh, I'll shut up. Oh, thank you for that, Tony. That was brilliant. Uh, and yeah, I couldn't agree more that like everybody has assistance. What we learned <laughs> during those few months of uh, research talks was that uh, rarely is it the artist's own hand <laughs> making the thing. Yeah, and and you know, I'm I'm kind of guilty is the wrong word, but you know, I I, I know that. But I have worked with fabricators who were sworn to secrecy. And I'll go in those studios and I'll recognize something and say, oh, is that for Yinka or Damien or whoever, you know, Mark Quinn, you know, because you recognize work. And they'll say, oh, I can't say. I say Why not? Well, I'm contractually, um, I'm contractually una unable to say who I make work for. You know, you shouldn't have seen that. Stop poking around in the back room sort of thing. <laughs> and, uh, and it is a lot of people are contractually barred from saying who they make work for i'm totally unashamed about that <laughs> and on my website i usually name check everybody and i always show process because i think process is really fascinating yeah that's what all this is about yeah. is exactly what we're talking about nigel can you tell us who you're working for <laughs> Hello. Well, <laughs> funny enough, I was, that was ringing so many bells with me, Tony. Beautiful talk. And Anna, thank you for that. Um, but yeah, non-disclosure agreements. Bloody hell, you sign them all the time. Mm. Sign two today. You uh, won't have to sign any for me, Nigel. When you make my next piece, <laughs> you can tell anybody about it. What a relief. But they also, <laughs> you know, they, it's, it's slightly just for the sake of the artist because... I don't think anyone's that particularly interested. It's just a legal pr process that they go through. And um, 
we are fabricators and you know we we do this because we love making stuff so we haven't really got the ego thing going on that a lot of artists have driven with um and we we just love making stuff so i can do a quick blitz through our little presentation so uh that yes welcome to mdm <laughs> yeah, we make all we make all kinds of stuff for all kinds of people, uh, from tiny little things to whopping great things, and we've been doing it for nigh on thirty years now. So we've worked in a million different materials and a million different processes, and this is just a very brief snapshot. It's not particularly aimed at the art world; these pickies, but they're just a, a broad scope of what fabricators get up to. That first thing there, if you go back up, that's like if you see the little person at the bottom, that's a you could just about see them down there. That's it's like a giant shape inside the Palais Royal in Paris. And you can go inside it and it's got an airlock with like revolving doors where you climb inside. So it's actually inflatable. Um and that piece is um like Tony's pieces, it's CAD designed and engineered, so you only know it's gonna work when you blow it up on the day it's opening. And luckily it worked. So that one now resides in two shipping containers somewhere, but because uh, it only fits in that one building. Um, so next picky, our workshop. So our workshops are um, very varied. Uh, they encompass lots of different techniques, lots of different materials, lots of different ways of working as well. Some artists come and work with us and others, you never see them. Others, you never get anything other than a, a, an email. Others communicate in many different ways. Um, I was thinking before this chat, how do people communicate their ideas across? And it's so varied. Artists are you know, famously nutty and will be communicating any way they can with a passion, usually. And so we've had people that send you uh, fully specced up design packages, and we've had people that will also want artworks making where they've sung songs down the phone and said, you need to, you need to experience this song to really appreciate what it is I need building. And others will send you sketches or drawings, or they'll just describe what they want. There's there's very few barriers between the fabricator and your idea um, when it comes to how you communicate it. You've just got to get on the phone, on the internet, get drawing something, however you want to do it, and send it across, because usually the fabricator's dealt with all kinds of dribs and drabs to get the idea across, so it's not something to be scared of. Just launch in, approach them, and um, if they're good, they'll help you out. Um, so next picture, that's a, that's a piece where the artist there said, I want a cannon and it's got a shoot, uh, these great big lumps of red wax, a bit like lipstick. And we want to shoot 20 tons at a time and we want to be able to ship it around the world. So it's got to get through customs. So it can't be like a normal cannon. So, and that was the brief. And so I don't care what it looks like. I want it to look something like uh, the back of a cement mixer. Um, and that was it. So you then come up with whatever you come up with. You do some tests. This one was quite interesting because we had a big yard at the time in uh, Brixton in South London. And we thought, how are we going to test this thing? Because it's air powered. So we bought an old, we were next door to a, a junk, uh, sorry, a scrap yard. So we bought an old camper van and thought we'll fire it at the camper van because we couldn't fire it at the wall because we thought it might blow the wall down. We couldn't fire it in the air because we didn't know where it would go. And we thought we need something solid to fire it at. So we got a camper van and fired it at it and it went straight through the camper van and out the other side and straight against the railway arch. And so it was a bit of a voyage of discovery making um, cannons, but that's that's fabricating. It's, uh, it's just being pragmatic and um, dealing with whatever you've got to deal with just getting on with it and sorting out the problems um and that worked really well that piece uh, next picky uh yeah different size things those those are different size sort of outdoor sculptures um the one on the left's made out of hydroformed uh stainless steel and they're actually um milk 
containers from Australia, so New, New Zealand, and they store milk in them, but they're, they're pumped full of water and they pop out like a sphere because they've been uh, specifically designed to be that shape when they're pressurised and then they're polished and we put them together in a big pile like that. One in the middle is uh, Yinka Shonabare. That's a series of sculptures that we've done for him. I think we've done 11 or 12 of them now and they're dotted all over the world. They're um, a piece of fabric um, made 3D and big. One on the right is um, Tatlin's Tower for Royal Academy. Um, and there was a, an issue with that because it, apparently it was unbuildable. So they said, could you have a go at building it? Because apparently it's unbuildable. So you get your pragmatic head on again as a fabricator and you just start working it out how it's going to be put together. Um, we get structural engineers involved and we get mechanical engineers involved if anything's got to move. So we came up with a, a design. We tweaked it a little bit, but nobody noticed. Um, structural engineers signed it all off and then we could build it. And I think that piece is now at the Sainsbury's Art Centre. Uh, down again. More, more um, challenging works. Uh, the one on the top left there, that's a bus from the uh, Italian job. And the artist there said, I want to, I want it, that's in, Hong, I think that's in Hong Kong, that one. I want it teetering on the top of a hotel as if it's about to fall down. Um, and that was the brief. It was like the bus from the Italian job teetering on a building. So that's what you work with. Um, that piece worked very nicely. It's just, it was hydraulic. Uh, the top middle is a piece with um, uh, another artist who likes to work in concrete a lot and lead. A German artist and he is very experimental so he'll have you build these things which look like little tower blocks and then he'll look at them and say yes this is good but what does it look like if we push it over so you then get a crane and you push it over and see how it looks and said no it's not not like that put it back together so you put it back together again and it's like working with a giant lego kit and a very destructive attitude but yeah artists are artists um, top right, that's a very kind of normal uh, mural piece. Um, that artist gave us that image pretty much as it looks there. Uh, and he designed it, done the colour spec on it, said it's got to last 20 years or whatever, and it's 25 metres tall. And that's a pretty straight art piece to work on. Um, down a bit. That one on the left is a ball, sphere, uh, globe, and the artist there communicated uh, that they wanted the uh, United Nations globe of the world, political globe, uh, upside down, but the text the right way up. Uh, so the opposite way to it normally, how it normally is. So that, that's, that's what you get, and that's all you need really, and a scale. And we sort out all the legalities and the road closures and the structural and the foundations and all that stuff. So you can literally have the germ of an idea, come at somebody, come at somebody like us with it and say, is this possible? How much will it cost? And we, in theory, can sort the problems out and get it organised. That one in the middle is another stretched piece like that big one we saw at the beginning, steel and um, vinyl. That's in Vers Palace of Versailles. Uh, the one on the right is a giant mirror. Uh, that was an artist, and they wanted a, Lond a typical London house that you could lay on and be reflected in the mirror to look like you were climbing it. Um, it's like a, a giant photo op, but a lot of fun for everybody um, and very easy for everyone to have a go on it. You just lay on the floor. Uh, down a bit. Uh, yeah, that one on the left is a giant gun. That's in cast steel, and it's leaning against a tree. Uh, issues with that is you can't lean giant. That weighs about five tons, that gun. You can't lean it against a tree because it pushed the tree over in time. So you've got to dig a foundation without hurting the tree roots, anchor it to that so there's no weight against the tree. So... Got a lot. Of, it's a simple idea. It's based on a Gainsborough painting, but it's a sim nice, simple idea. But there's a lot of technical sort of shenanigans going on with it. You've got to deal with that. It's what your fabricator should be doing and taking the problem away from you, so you can come up with your fantastic idea. One on the right is a train track covered in bamboo. 
Um, again, a lot of legal dicking around with that. And in the end, it looks quite simple, straightforward and um, elegant, but there's an awful lot of uh, fabricator angst that goes on to try and get it made, made on a train track. Uh, but hopefully the artists are quite happy with it and haven't had to deal with um, all that kind of, this black side of it. Uh, Dan again. More sculptures, these are repeat sculptures. Um, that particular artist gave us a small uh, African sculpture and said, enlarge that and make loads of them out of graphite. So we enlarged it and made loads of them out of graphite. And they uh, have a weight in the bottom and they get displayed in different orientations. Uh, I think there's about a hundred of them in the end. Uh, down a bit. There's, thus on the left is uh, artists who wanted two big slugs climbing up the uh, Tate Gallery. But they, she wanted to, them to be made out of wicker and hessian and um, materials like that, that could very easily be recycled afterwards. So they're Christmas lights, hessian, wicker and plywood. And they, the, the, um, the lights going up and down the building are uh, supposedly the slime trails of the slugs. Uh, the one on the right is a, one of the fourth plinth, London Trafalgar Square, fourth plinth pieces. And that's a, that was for Yinker again. Um, and he said, um, I want a model of, of Nelson's flagship in a massive bottle um, with African fabric sails. And that was, that was the brief. So you generate it from there. And then the artist comes back to you with comments on your drawings or whatever, and you slowly get a finished drawing organized. That one again, has got a lot of technical shenanigans going on because the bottom of it is full of um, air conditioning systems. Um, down a bit. Zoo work, do a lot, not zoo, museum work rather, do a lot of things like that where you've got to replicate animals um, without using any taxidermy. Uh, down again. Same again. They're all made using fake materials, so no real things. And again, that's another one. Big monster, uh, early whale for another museum in fiberglass. Down again. More museum -y stuff. These are kind of interactive, light-up, moving characters. Uh, down again. Shop fit. A lot of shop fit. It's all, you, you, you might be doing artwork one day and then you're doing a shop window another day, but it's all more, more of the same materials being used. Down again. More shop fit. More of the same. Could be in a gallery or a shop window. That's the same gallery or shop window, just all different materials. Big bird for a, an event, uh, lots of different materials, mainly carbon fiber. Big bloke for a concert, that was Take That. Mm. And it's, um, it's based around a series of cherry pickers welded together with a, the fiberglass shell over the top. And he kind of stands up and holds the band in his hands. So massive, great thing. Um, down again. Another exhibition thing, big whale. Uh, swims around, and again, stage shows, Rolling Stones, concerts, um, staging, things like that, very varied. Down again. Football art, done a lot of football art, who'd have thought? But yeah, football stadiums like statues of players um, in bronze. Stage shows. Uh, quite a bit of stage show kind of stuff. More stage shows. Looks like an old greenhouse, but it's a stage show. Map of us. That's it. <laughs> very much. So, yeah, very wide ranging and rambling that, but the point being that don't be scared to approach a fabricator at all, because um, we can sort out your job, however large or small. Brilliant. Thank you, Nigel. It's always just mind-blowing to see the stuff that you're producing um, and to see the kind of things that 
that you do your problem solving magic on. It's just brilliant. Yeah. Um, when it works. <laughs> when it works. We never see the ones that don't work though. I mean, that, that's one of the things, that's one of the reasons why I think these discussions about fabrication are really important because for me and for a lot of people we never get to see this side of it we never get to see how the things are made we just see the finished product and how it's produced and who it's produced by is a kind of closely guarded secret so it's brilliant to kind of open this up and, and talk about it um to begin with i wanted to ask tony and anna um about your work and about how you work on a kind of more day-to-day -day basis and the, the the ways that your work and the ways that you, you make your work is affected by um, your disabilities um, and, and the kind of aspects that are affected by it that an, an able-bodied or neurotypical person might just take for granted, things that I or other people don't have to think about. Anna, what, what kind of things do you have to bear in mind when you're making work what kind of systems and structures do you do you have to put in place to to allow you to make your work yeah i mean it kind of it kind of fluctuates the things that affect me will fluctuate so my ability to function will fluctuate quite a lot and that makes it just on a purely pragmatic level really difficult to do things like schedule meetings or make sure you can meet deadlines for getting your piece you know in whatever show it's it's um meant to be in um you know, for example, this year I was really ill for about the first six months of the year and I did very, very little. And that means now I'm really stressed and anxious because I've got to have a piece ready for January that I'm just desperately behind with. Um, so that's just a bit frustrating. And it's one of those things that, you know, there's nothing to be done in the way of access on that. It is what it is. And you sort of live with a certain degree of chaos and, and sort of moving from frustration to, to, to massive anxiety and stress when you are then well enough to, to do stuff. Um, and that's kind of because of working around things like pain and, and fatigue and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, sometimes maybe you're just not gonna deliver something as big or something as good as, as you might have wanted to, to deliver. Um, but having said that, I'd say the sort of by far the biggest barriers for me are, are more the kind of cognitive issues around things like executive function and actually psychological issues around anxiety um, and that's one of those kind of interesting things in having these conversations with people about how you know your, your issues affect you and um, particularly with kind of non-disabled people and there's kind of all these dramatic impressive things like you know I've had 12 kidney operations it's like oh you know and actually that stuff doesn't get in the way of my work yeah. at all. Um, but it's the things that are really hard to explain that are the big problems and they, they don't sound like they're a big deal. So, so you know, stuff like the executive function issues I have are huge and, and, and really make me quite unable to organise anything, really like really basic things and just don't like, I, I, I don't want to sort of get too much into like the nitty gritty of my disabilities or whatever, but, um, you know, things like sometimes I can really struggle just to kind of feed myself to kind of go into a supermarket and organise the information to get, come away with like actual food. So the idea that I'm going to be able to organise a massive project like Breathing Room with all of those strands, it's, it's not going to happen without significant help, without someone else's brain that doesn't forget things and can organise the information and kind of sift that and put it together. So th those would be the kind of big things for me, kind of mixture of, you know, quite, quite physical, prosaic, frustrating things and then cognitive frustrating things. Yeah. Um, Tony, how does it work for you in terms of um, different aspects of your work? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm probably start off by saying that my early work was rooted in uh, the politics of disability. So it was sort of uh, propagandist, uh, my early work, and uh, it was rooted around the social model of disability. And if you don't know what the social model of disability is, you really need to go and find out about it. Mm. Um, because for somebody like me, everything... I do is like that I go straight back to the social model when I think about anything um, that I'm about to do in my life. So I never think that non-disabled people are at an advantage to me in making work other than they simply don't face the barriers or the discrimination or the oppression that I face when others make assumptions about what I can and what I can't do. So I've got to get through that barrier before we start. Um, but barriers might be, for me, things like physical access to art school or to university. 
you know, lack of wheelchair access or facilities that don't meet my needs or machinery that's set up in a way that I can't use it. And that's not about my impairment. That's about poor design or it's about poor installation or it's about um, getting past the gatekeeper who doesn't want me in their department, you know, thinks I'm a fire risk or that I might compromise their health and safety. You know, these are the sort of barriers that people like me have to get past. And, and that will affect my inclusion and it will exclude me and put me at a disadvantage. So they're the th sorts of things that non-disabled people wouldn't have to face and wouldn't have to challenge. And yeah. it's, around, it's around uniformity of design and um, lack of courage from people who do, you know, and architects are often, you know, I, I level my criticism often at people that just design things in a very conservative and safe way. And of course that can be very excluding to a wheelchair user or somebody that has limited mobility uh, or whatever, whether that's the built environment or the, the physical environment. I mean, one of the great things about um, making sculpture and working with fabricators is often their workshops are pretty accessible places uh, uh, by and large. And um, the other thing I'd just say about that is disabled people need to be really assertive, plan in advance, always have alternative set of solutions because somebody will always be saying no at you all the time. So you've got to kind of work your way around the no. Um, and of course the downside to that is that we're always gonna be deemed as difficult or troublemakers uh, and as such, we're always gonna be unpopular. Uh, and we just need to be prepared for that really. It's what makes us great problem solvers, great strategists and great lateral thinkers. Oh, that doesn't sound too too sort of um, either aggressive or de uh, depressing really. But um, I just think you've got to be organized. Uh, um, I think my ideas are as valid as anybody else's though. I can understand that mm -hmm. they might not resonate as powerfully for an non-disabled audience who might not quite fully understand some of the, you know, some of the nature of my practice. Um, that's the practical, you know, I mean, I'll talk about practical things later, but, but pretty much it's getting through barriers in the outside world and getting through people's attitudes, which are, which, yeah. which are disabling, really. Once you've combated those two things, then you're kind of on, on the level ground, so to speak. Yeah. So in terms of how you, like the practicalities of stone yeah. carving from a wheelchair, like yeah. How do you do this, Tony? Okay, well, I'd, I'd go back to my architectural analogy for a minute and say that I don't want to pour molten bronze, just as I would imagine that an architect doesn't want to lay a line of bricks or <laughs> cement lintels over doors or lay concrete. You know, I do like to watch my work being cast or fettled and patinated or built. You know, if, if Nigel was making something for me, I'd be down there quite a lot checking things out and kind of being quite hands-on really. So I said, well, why are you doing it like that? Can I do that bit? You know, how, do, how does that work? And now he might be like, yeah, all right, stick him in a cherry picker, get him up there, let's have a look at what's going on. Or he might be, no, that's completely not possible uh, because you might have an accident. You know, and then we have a discussion about, you know, what's, what's he got to do with him about how I, you know, and then he'll say, well, it's my building and my insurance. And so we have that sort of discussion. But often, you know, I'll just nag them and um, often they'll just say, oh, fuck it, you know, get him in there and get on with it and let's not worry about it. Because they often are risk takers as well. You know, I mean, Nigel was saying earlier about, you know, some things aren't going to work, you know, so we are, we're always taking risks, really. Um, yeah. Sorry, Claire, well, you asked me a specific thing there and I went <laughs> off on a tangent. What was it about machinery? <laughs> No, it was about just practicality. Practical work. How you make work. Yeah, if, if I don't know whether um, Adam's still there, but I put a few slides in to, um, to to show some of the machinery that I use to move stone about and some of the some of the processes that I use. So if there's anybody that can flick my slides up on the screen. Yes. Uh, this those. first slide is a bit ambiguous, but it actually just shows my lift in the corner of my studio. So I've got a platform lift, which takes me from, this is my upstairs kind of clean, where I do clean stuff uh, um, and, and 
after I've been up here doing clean stuff, then I go downstairs to do the sort of messy stuff. So the next slide, which shows my downstairs bit of studio, this is where I do most of my stone carving or marble cutting or whatever it is. So um, just in this photograph is a piece of equipment called a strong arm. I think they're a couple of hundred quid. They're not massively expensive. Uh, it'll lift about a ton. It all folds up so you can stash it against. This actually sits under that staircase um, and it just hooks against the wall. But um, the legs drop down so it can be wheeled. I can wheel that very easily. It's just, it's no different than wheeling a supermarket trolley. In fact, it's a lot easier than pushing some supermarket trolleys. And basically what happens is you pump, it, you, you literally pump the big red thing in the middle. You put a strap around the hanging bit. So for this piece, which is called Zen Girls, this piece of marble, I think it weighs about 400 kilos. Uh, it's impossible for me to move physically on my own. I can't even sort of slide it from side to side. So basically put a strap underneath it I, I pump up the strong arm. I might only pump it up an inch because all I want to do is turn it round on the bench. And the bench that is on is, um, those of you that have been in hospital will recognise the pump up beds that you get in hospitals. So, so I can't remember whether this is a sort of massage table from a hospital or a bed, but it's basically one of those beds that you can pump up and you can sort of see the foot bit in the middle I'm pointing at it like you can see it, but I, I think you get the idea. If you pump it up, then that bed raises up and it goes down. I basically ripped all the bed bits off and put a big wooden board on and I just use it as a, it can elevate, you know, up to 500 kilos, I guess, maybe more. So I can pump it up or I can lower it down just at the touch of a button. So you no real strength involved in that. If we go to the next slide, again, it just shows the sort of, the, the the pump up from the other side and that white bar that you can see it it, it pumps up at my height at seated height so you literally just pump that up and down it's really quite easy to pump and to let it down you put it on a screw and you just you use the end of it and you just turn it and down it goes so you can sort of tighten it or lower it and it, it can as I say it can lift pretty pretty big big weights and of course you can wheel it around the room so once I've got that up on that chain I can I can wheel that uh, um, I usually keep the stone quite low to the floor because I don't want it to you know to fall off or, or get damaged or anything but I can I can push that around the studio and I can move it around uh, entirely on my own I can swing the work when it's up on the strong arm so sort of swing it into place stick a block to stop it swinging back and then just lower it down if we go to the next, yeah, this is just lifting a, a block of Portland stone off of that um, sack truck, really, behind it. All my tech's fairly old technology. You know, I lifted that off the ground. I lifted a corner of it with um, a straightforward, um, um, gosh, the word's gone out of my head. Uh, um, it's a metal thing. It's like a big S shape. Uh, um, God, what is it called? I'll think of it in a minute when I don't have to think about it or Nigel will say what it is. Uh, um, a crowbar, it's just a crowbar. Ah. All right, so it literally at my height sat down, I put a crowbar, I have a piece of wood in my hand, I push the crowbar, not putting a lot of weight on it. It lifts it up maybe an inch. I just stick a little bit of wood under it, like a bit of firewood, that holds it up. And then I push my, um, I, I push my um, trolley. If we just go back to the trolley, Okay, we won't go back to the trolley and it doesn't really matter. Sorry, yep, yeah, the next one after that. Yep, yeah, I just push that trolley under it, which is just like a sack truck, tip it backwards, the stone just falls on it and I wheel it to where I want it. And while it's up in the air, I just rack the, um, the, the uh, whatever it's called, the strap around it and then just pump it and lift it up, basically move it wherever I want it. Um, we can show the next slide just the studio's full of marble dust there but just say uh, these I think these pump up trucks are about four or five hundred quid each that one it was a lot cheaper because I made it out of the hospital bed but you can see under this smaller piece of stone on the left on the yellow pump up truck 
uh, we make things like uh, wooden triangles. That's just made out of three inch by two inch bits of wood. And basically what you use a triangle like that for is that you can lift the stone up and push the triangle under it and it just stops it rolling off the bench. And you can roll, you can roll the stone around within the triangle or you can put the triangle up on something. So it kind of holds your stone in place. And often you'll knock one of them up depending on what size of stone you're, you're using. And that's my lift at the bottom, which access to work paid for. And I can talk a little bit about access to work if you want me to. Yeah, um, one of the things I was going to ask both of you, actually, Anna and Tony, is about funding, because this is this is one of the really critical yeah. questions about accessibility. Yeah. Like, who pays for this stuff? Like, how do you get the funding and how do you get the support? And Anna, I'd really like to talk to you in a moment about your producer as well, because we are getting questions about your producer uh, and how you get a producer in the chat. So, Tony, if you could, if you could tell us a bit more about the, the funding. All right, I'll, I'll just finish with the last slide, because for me, this the last slide is really important. It's not probably very important for anybody else, but... um. And I say this just as Claire's probably turned the slides off. But if you can flick <laughs> the last slide, again, and I'll just busk a little bit while um, while that slide comes up. Just the last slide. Next slide on. Next slide. Yeah, this is my toilet, which is called uh, the, the public inconvenience. And I really just wanted to show you because it's part of my sense of humour is that my doorway into my toilet is wheelchair accessible height. So if any of you guys were having to go and use my loo, you'd either bang your head or you'd have to bend down really quite <laughs> low to get in and out the toilet. And it, so it's called the public inconvenience because it inconveniences you, yeah. ambulant people for a few split seconds. But what I'm trying to tell you is that's what my life is like because of the way you've created the world. Not you personally, obviously, but but ambulant people, non-disabled people have created a world that we can't function in. So um, my little retribution is the joke of me downstairs filling you with great cups of tea so that you then say, oh, have you got a loo? And I can send you upstairs and not tell you that you're going to bang your head or you're going to, have to be really careful. And you can't really tell from this image but the door's quite well disguised because there's no handle on the front of it it's just made out of all that wooden stuff so you can't actually see unless you look closely where the toilet is which kind of confuses people too anyway that's enough crap and bullshit but <laughs> it's uh, it, it gives me no end of pleasure like all those small things give us pleasure i could t i could totally <laughs> get that <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so talk to me about funding me or anna both of you, because you, you've both had you've both had um, different kinds of funding as well. Anna, yeah. can you tell us about the funding that you got for Breathing Room? Because that that will segue nicely into how you ended up having a producer for the work as well. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't I hadn't heard of a producer, I and mean, again, before sort of working with Unlimited and getting the funding, it wouldn't have been clear to me how it could possibly, you know, do achieve those things and do those things, um, and so. You know, they, they I mean, a lot of disability arts comes from a kind of more theatre based model, which I think is where producer comes from. I don't know if other visual artists outside of disability arts would call it a producer or outside of outdoor arts anyway would call it a producer. But for me, it was essentially like a, a sort of project manager. And that was kind of written in from the beginning. Um, but also for a lot of things like that, I'm able to use my access to work money. So um, and I can use it for all kinds of things because anything that's related to, to disability. So sometimes, for example, if it's like being on site, we always make sure that we pay an extra person to essentially be my pair of hands. And if I'm having a day where I just can't do anything, we're not down a team member because we were able to pay someone to kind of replace me while I wasn't well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all sorts of things like that um, that you can do with your access to work money as long as it relates to the, the stuff that you have difficulty with. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, it was like a really big punt doing the unlimited thing. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, very green compared to, to to Tony, and so for me, it's been fascinating just listening to like you know Nigel talking about his thing and think, oh, one day, one day. <laughs> so, so can you tell me a bit more about what your producer actually did for you as well during during the making of Breathing Room? What kind of things did she help you with? 
I mean everything so keeping you know, <laughs> all the strands of, of everything doing kind of email communications with people bits of research um yeah just just like anything that would require like organizing anything basically um she she's done that and actually it was really strange for me because I've never done this before either and she said a lot of what she was doing was much more than what she would do in a normal production job and that's because it was kind of bleeding into access work but I'm not sure which bit would be which because having only done this the first time I don't know the model for what it would usually be like and what is is different in working with me um I would say that I'm quite a counterpoint to Tony in that I sort of um experience almost exactly the opposite problems and that I'm constantly expected to be able to do what other people can do because I don't look disabled and so my my life is constantly dealing with suspicion that she, well, she can't be very disabled because she looks fine and constant justification and constant explanations and and I'm for various reasons not very fond of the social model I find it really disempowering and and the sort of it's very sort of draconianly applied in disability arts which actually I find makes me feel quite excluded from from disability arts because it's not a model that fits me very well so yeah. sort of those interesting things we need to talk about that because um yeah we need to talk about that because it shouldn't it shouldn't be like that because it's not about us it's about the world and uh, and how the well, world that's how you feel about it Tony but yeah. I, I I feel like it actually is it's about the stuff my body can't do and it's about the stuff my brain can't do and I don't really need to outsource that to the world yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. no we need a gin and tonic to um, kind of <laughs> well, we'll play about the social model <laughs> <laughs> that's that's where most of the conversations about the social model have been over the last 30 odd years have been yeah. in a bar having a gin and tonic really um, yeah do you think it do you think it's helpful because that we're becoming more aware of invisible disabilities? Does that is that in any way useful in terms of the way people respond to to the problems you have? It's really variable. Um... And also, I mean, for me, it was actually a really weirdly long journey to get to the point that I could pinpoint what my own access needs were. Yeah. Um, you know, and that that's one of you sort of said at the end, you'd ask if we sort of had advice. And, and it was kind of echoing what Tony said earlier, like just be really clear with people what your access needs are, what you need them to do to help you to make it accessible for you. And if you already know what that is, that's great. You can just do that. And by and large, people will want to help you. Um, and, and for me, it was like this weirdly long journey of trying to figure out, well, what can they do to make it easier mm -hmm. for me? And, and some stuff can be made easier, some stuff can't. And it's just a matter of trying to communicate that to people and, and, and doing things like, you know, I need a hotel right next to the site. So if I'm not yeah. well, I can pop back and forth um, to get in my car, drive for 20 minutes, rest for 20 minutes, drive back, you know, that kind of stuff, you know. And, yeah. Because there's a lot of things that are difficult for you that, that people just wouldn't consider, like negotiating travel, long distances, negotiating rest periods and your energy levels and all those kind of things that, like, the, you know, people people have no idea that that's a problem. So you have to be quite forthright about telling them that this is a problem. Mm. I mean, I don't think I'm ever forthright, to be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> just a bit kind of like, this is, this is what I'd like, please, kind of thing. And, but generally, you know, generally people want to, to help and they want to be obliging and kind of explain stuff to them. But I mean, so, so, very occasionally, I'm not at work, actually. I've never had a sort of negative experience access-wise with work. But I mean, certainly in your personal life, you encounter people all the time who just kind of almost don't believe you. They just think, I should be able to see that there's something wrong with you. And if I can't, it, it just can't be, kind of thing. And then it's... Um, it's really odd it sort of splits you off from yourself and, and makes you feel like sort of two different people you're this person that they're expecting you to be and then there's this thing that you actually are that you can't quite get them to acknowledge and it all gets a bit excuse mm. me <laughs> yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna rattle on about the social model but that's that's the essence of you know people have to believe what we tell people and uh, getting mm -hmm. back to what you said claire about invisible impairments I think it's great because way way back in time, people say, well, there aren't many people like you in wheelchairs, you know, so you're a minority. And it's like, well, no, actually, we're not a minority. You know, 20% of the um, population of disabled people, you might not be able to see it and it might not be, a, it, 
obviously apparent, but people are. And actually, you know, we have to believe what people tell us. You know, and people have a real hard... I have the opposite effect. People have a real hard job believing what we tell them. And on the occasions when I stand up in the supermarket to reach something down from the top shelf, I'm viewed in disbelief and mm. suspicion, you know, because it, it's kind of that... Oh, people just think if you use a wheelchair you're in it all the time you know and if you sort of lean surreptitiously against the sort of kellogg's cornflakes and reach up for whatever it is you wanted they they're kind of astonished you know and often people say oh can i help you get something off the top shelf and you say oh that's kind of you thank you but it's okay i can get it myself and i just stand up and 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 they, they, it does freak people out so mm -hmm. uh, okay. yeah yeah Nigel, can I ask you as well, from your perspective in the fabrication studio, um, how do fabrication studios support artists with different needs? Like what can you do from your end to support different projects and different different practical needs? Yeah, uh, interesting what Tony was saying about uh, artists being pragmatic. And that's, I think, the approach that any fabricator that's worth talking to should have as well. So if you do have needs that aren't obvious, then communicate them and we'll do whatever we can to make it happen. Um, we're very used to problem solving. That's like 80% of the job. So if there are issues that need getting over, we will get over them one way or another we will do it. Um, it might seem daunting when you're disabled and I can appreciate that, but approach somebody like us and we will try our very best to make it accessible and make it an easy process for you to get something underway and fabricated or made or created or whatever. Um, in our building itself, it's we're just redoing part of our building and we've put some more levels in it two more floors in it and one of the main one of the first things we did was we looked for a lift so that we could get people up to the other floors um who may be in a wheelchair uh, we've got ramps everywhere uh, so you can get pretty much all across the fabricating area it's all on one level and if it's not it's on a ramp to it so that's pretty useful from point of view of the health and safety, which you do have to deal with all the time, we have health and safety officer and they do what's called an induction for anyone new that comes to work with us. And they assess, they talk to you, assess what you can do, what you can't do, and then they will advise you what you can and what you can't do. It's usually you can do whatever you want, as long as it's not like trapezing around the place. But the equipment's made so it can be at different heights. We can put rosters in front of things with ramps. Um, so we try and be as accessible as possible. Whatever your issue might be, we just stay open and problem solve about it. Yeah. That's what, what we try and do. I, I just really want to come and trapeze around your studio in there. That was like a gauntlet oh. thrown down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we do <doing> next week. <laughs> we've had some um, questions in the chat, several of which we've, we've answered already. Um, one of the questions is about storage. How do you store stuff after it's been made? <laughs> and do you do you make work with that in mind? And this is a this is a problem that actually every artist I ever talk to has. So do you have any specific strategies for this at all, either of you? It's just an ongoing headache because you've got to find money to try and rent space to store it so it's try to find some friendly local who who's got some warehouse that isn't public facing and will rent you a cheap amount of square footage to kind of dump stuff in um my, my studio that i work in is rented from a carnival arts company and they've got two kind of warehouse spaces and we pay an amount each month but you know it's, it's sort of desperately then needs the piece to bring in enough money to keep paying for its own storage and then the kind of nightmare scenario is oh my god I have to just put it in a skip because I can't I can't store it anymore kind of thing you know, so. yeah it's a problem for me too I mean I've got my studio space which is great because I can store I've got a yard I can store stone outside in the yard it gets full of dust and dirt and everything but you can soon hose it off and polish it up I got my studio in London which is a clean space which so I can put prints 
you know, drawings, prints, paintings, stuff like that all goes down there and it kind of is a storage space. Um, big pieces like Gold Lame, what a nightmare. You know, when mm. that came back from America, I'd sort of forgotten that it had gone out the Blue Coat Gallery and it went to America. I didn't really have much to do with it. And then suddenly I got this email from uh, um, this guy in um, wh wherever he was in America saying, uh, we, we want to mail this ship this shipment back to you. Where do you want it? And I thought, well, well, I don't know. <laughs> it's a massive packing case, you know, with a car in it. And uh, I, put, I live in an apartment and um, I put it in my under my garage that's underneath the um, underneath and the neighbours, well, the management company were really, uh, I got a deputation of people with clipboards saying, you can't leave that there. And I said, why not? It's because it's not a car. I said, it's got three wheels <laughs> and it's a car. It's called an Emily carriage, but all the windows are painted gold. I said, yep, this is true. It's a car, but it's off the road at the moment. It's got a sawn, which it hasn't, of course. And I, I was able to point to the guy opposite who's got a classic car under a, a green tarpaulin sheet. And I said, well, that car has never moved in all the years I've lived here. It's got a tarpaulin sheet over it. I don't see what the difference is. If I put a tarpaulin sheet over this, will that make you happy? And they grumbled and grumbled. And, and then it went um, on the Liverpool plinth. And Chris Butler then stored it he, very kindly stored it because he's got a massive warehouse in Liverpool and, and he, we just went back in his big box and stuck in a corner and uh, and and bef and then it's, he stored it for a while before it went up to Glasgow and it's in Glasgow I think for three years so I've got to find a gallery that's going to show my work in three years time that's that slides into Gold Lame coming back um, so it it is a massive problem deconstructing things, you know. The the, the the big piece for Channel Four is in the farmyard that Millimeter have at, I think in Brighton somewhere. You know these things. There's just a graveyard of sculpture in every fabricate fabricator's yard somewhere. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, I know a lot of sculptors who store things on farms in containers. It seems yeah. to be a div diversification for yeah. um, British farmers at the moment is yeah. sculpture. The, the proper <laughs> thing, the keen thing that sets you running is get some exhibitions lined up, and then you know once you get the exhibition lines up, you can start shipping stuff out from wherever it is. But of course, then how do you do that then, Tony? How do, how well, do I get exhibitions lined up? Just like, just well, like that. Well, <laughs> Literally, everyone in the chat function wants to know this. Yeah, well, it's blooming hard work, isn't it? You know, it's constantly, it's constantly yeah. knocking on doors, really. Yeah, uh, trying to find bits of funding, trying to talk to curators. I mean, the biggest problem for disabled artists is the fact that people just walk straight past and and don't engage with the work. You know, there are. I don't think there are any works of disability arts in the Arts Council's collection. Uh, um, and until curators start seeing work that we make and start connecting it into the sort of exhibitions that people are curating around, you know, any subject you want, you know, life, British life, you know, the tape, I can't remember what it's said. British life over the last century, whatever, I can't even remember what it was now. But no no disability arts in there, no sense that there are disabled people who've been in this country forever and 20% oh, yeah. of the population of us are disabled. And yet, you know, we are um, we are uh, excluded. And, uh, and that's what we need to get. We need to get curators uh, um, to, to see us, you know. Uh, um, I do knock on curators' doors. Um, I've I've had exhibitions in places that have said very clearly and in big letters, um, "Do not approach us. Or if we're interested, we will approach you." And I just ignore that stuff. I'd rather they told me to be face. No, we'll come and approach you. And um, and sometimes once they start to understand us a bit more, then they'll they might take our work on i can understand why they do it they would be absolutely bombarded by artists you know i know this from from being chief, chief executive at shape you know people do bombard you with stuff and do get incredibly hurt when you aren't able to give them an exhibition 
Yeah, it, this is true. It, this is true of all artists, though. We, as a curator, we we do get bombarded. Yeah. But you know, I I can't say don't do it because you know <laughs> sometimes it does work. Well, it's and, definitely and for every me. for every fifty artists who don't get a show, one yeah. will. Yeah. You know, it, the odds it, will eventually be in your favour. Yeah. And and the, just to clarify, the Arts Council collection. I was talking about disability arts, which is a genre. It's not just work by disabled artists. I know Yinka Shonabari has work in the Arts Council collection. Ryan Gander has got work in the Arts Council collection. I'm talking specifically about disability arts, which was, which is part of a historical journey, which changed English law and brought about the Disability Discrimination Act. You know, and I think that that art within a historical context is really important, you know, and that's the work that I think should be in public collections. Yeah, I, I think it is. Uh, it is a, a, fist a, a heavily missing, on the table. missing thing from, from <laughs> collections. Um, Anna, there's a question for you in the chat that we, we haven't got to about your piece work. How did you access the people to do that work? Yeah, I mean, again, it was sort of flying by the seat of our pants, really, because neither me nor my producer, um, you know, felt qualified to start doing things like writing job specs and figuring out how to find out who would be the right sort of local people to do this work. Um, and I reached out to a contact of mine who happens to work uh, as a volunteer coordinator, and she was doing that sort of in various sectors throughout her life she was working at the courts at that time so she would do things like they always have volunteers to work with witnesses and families of victims and that kind of thing in courts and she was like the volunteer coordinator for the people doing that sort of volunteering and so I just kind of reached out to her for advice really about how to do it and then she came on board actually as a team member and became a kind of coordinator essentially for us so helping us kind of mm -hmm. write the job spec where to put that job spec helping us decide who were the right people in liaising for us and, and sort of, um, you know, being, being our kind of contact then to each, to each cone, we'll call them the co-nails. <laughs> so yeah, that was, um, that was good really. But I mean, again, it's, there's not, I mean, anything I do that I don't really know how people in the proper art world do it. I just make it up as I go along. And um, that's probably why I'm not in the proper art world. <laughs> you are. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely are. Um, we are well over time now. So um, this has been really, really, really brilliant and, and enlightening in so many ways. Can we conclude with um, like maybe one piece of single piece of advice from all three of you in alphabetical order? Anna, what's your piece of advice to people interested in working with fabricators? Um. Oh, oh, there's two bits of advice. Um, oh, one, one, just, just sort of figure out your access needs and be really clear about it. And um, I guess, you know, I, one thing I didn't get to say was that if you're not from the art world, you know, you, you don't know things like fabricators. If you have like a cohort that you went to art school with and each one of their connections becomes one away from your connections and so on, and you have this kind of exponential group and if you're coming out from outside you don't even know what a sodding fabricator is and you're like a million miles away from that so you know you do do things like find things like disability arts organizations find things like organizations for emerging artists have little mentorship sessions you know meet people and ask them do you know anyone who does this how do I go about doing that and and try and just kind of extend out that way but you know you, you're sort of starting a long way behind the starting line compared to someone who did go to art school with with all of this stuff I think and, and you just have to kind of catch up really um in terms of of, of that kind of knowing people network thing and, and cognitive scripts of how things like the art world and fabricators work yeah, that is excellent advice thank you um and Tony yeah, I think there are a number of organisations that support disabled artists out there. My own organisation, Shape Arts, uh, Disability Arts Online, have just done a piece of work maybe last year on access to work and how to find your way through the maze of access to work. And if you talk to Trish Wheatley or Colin Hambrook at Dow, I'm sure they'll be really helpful around access to work. As I said, my lift was funded by access to work because I couldn't get up and down in that in the studio and um, 
but you've got to you've got to know how to approach access to work. Um, Dash it, it, Disability Arts Shropshire. I've got various projects and funding streams going. Um, uh, I was going to say something that I thought was really interesting that Anna talked about just then. And like as an artist, I get invited into art colleges sometimes to talk about my work. But I just wondered if people like Nigel get invited in to talk to art students and, and whether he would want to do that. Because, you know, as an art student, I didn't know any of this. You know, I did, we had a kind of some crappy tools and it, we weren't really encouraged to be makers, you know, you know, and nobody knew how to use, I mean, I was kind of older and practical, and, you know, the, because of the nature of my growing up in a working class place, you know, we were, I was kind of taking motorbikes apart when I was 11 years old and putting them back together again. And you kind of, you kind of figure out how things work, but for a lot of people, that's a completely new experience. Um, I, I, and the, the other thing I'd say is that you, you're kind of running a business. So you do have to do lots of non-art related things, which are a drag, you know, like doing your finances and applying for contracts and, you know, writing to curators with, you know, that's how musicians get John Peel to play their music, you know, way back in the 70s or whatever. And there are curators out there who are still, you know, there will be some who are courageous and, you, you know, you kind of do want waking up, you know, and knocking out some sort of warm middle class sort of uh, lethargy, you know, and um, I don't think they're averse to seeing interesting work or actually giving advice to people. Um, and I've completely lost track of what you asked me. Was it about working with fabricators? No, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think you, you, all the fabricators I've ever worked with have been brilliant to work yeah. with. You, you answered the them. question, which was what advice you would give people, and that's brilliant yeah. advice. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Nigel, what what would you advise people? I think you've already said just go for it and contact you. Is there is there, is there anything yeah. else? Yeah. Contact a fabricator, it doesn't have to be me, but it could be no, any not fabricator. necessarily you. <laughs> um, and if they're any good, then they'll listen to what you want to make and they will help. They're, they're there to help. We're not there to kind of put obstacles up. We want to make stuff. So don't be shy, just get in touch. If, As I said, if they're any good, it'll work. Brilliant. Thank you. And yeah, we must point out other fabricators are available. <laughs> we're not sponsored by MD. No. <laughs> well, listen, we're, we're going to have to wrap this up now. We're wildly over time, but it's been brilliant. Um, thank you so much to all three of our speakers, uh, to Anna Berry, to Tony Heaton and to Nigel Schofield and to all of you for watching and for asking fantastic questions and for your contributions. Uh, congratulations to Tony. Uh, to Tony, uh, we'll see him at Lumiere later on this year. Thank you. Um, you can see Anna's installation Breathing Room at WordFest in Wakefield from the 23rd to the 30th of October. So if you're in the North Yorkshire area, uh, West Yorkshire area, sorry, and uh, you are looking for something to do for half term, head over to Wakefield. It's then going to Gloucester's Bright Light Festival uh, from the 6th of November. And thank you very much as ever to Nigel uh, for your fantastic contributions as always. Uh, you can catch up with any of the Henry Moore Institute research events on our website, uh, where you can also find details of current exhibitions and upcoming talks and events, including our brand new research season on sculpture and poetry, uh, which begins in a couple of weeks time. So thank you all for watching. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it and that it's been useful and we look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye, everybody. <laughs>